Hello and welcome. I'm Patrick Curtis, your host and chief monkey, and this is the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Join me as I talk to some of the community's most successful and inspirational members to gain valuable insight into different career paths and life in general. Let's get to it. In this episode, Dan shares his unlikely path as a history major at a complete non-target college in the Midwest. We learn how he was unemployed when he first graduated, how his first job was in the back office, how he managed to break into a business analyst role at a respected boutique investment bank, and how he managed the delicate conversations to transition to a front office IB role at that same bank. Listen to how he navigated the private equity recruiting process and how one person made a dramatic shift in his thought process and trajectory. Enjoy. All right, Dan, welcome to the Wall Street Oasis podcast. Thanks for having me, Patrick. So it'd be a pleasure. Yeah, it'd be great if you could just give the listeners a short summary of your bio. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I'll just try to give a quick high level. Uh, grew up in New York State. Um, kind of uh, was a really strong uh, student of history in high school. You know, I did kind of well on math, was never really, uh, never really, you know, one of my main focuses. I would say I really liked history a lot more. Um, so when I went to college, I kind of wanted to, you know, focus on his. I didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do for my career. Um, and I think that's, you know, I think that's pretty, pretty normal for a 16 or a 17 year old. Um, and so, you know, I ended up uh, going to, a, you know, a small liberal arts school, um, very non-target, um, you know, in, in the Midwest. Um, I had a great experience there. Um, you know, I ended up majoring in history. So, um, you know, had kind of started to um, put my head into finance here and there. Um, I did have an internship that was kind of non-related um, when I was a junior, but it was really completely tangential to investment banking. And so, um, you know, I, I got out of school and I really had no, um, you know, I, I knew I kind of wanted to work in finance, but I just didn't know exactly what that meant. Totally. Um, I didn't know kind of um, the different paths in finance. I didn't really know about, you know, I knew kind of high level about investment banking and, um, but I didn't really know what investment bankers did or what private equity did, et cetera. So, um, you know, the first job I got out of school was kind of in the middle, uh, the middle office at a big bank, um, you know, which was kind of just taking what I could get. I, I, you know, I didn't, I had a history degree from a non-target school. There was no recruiting or anything like that. Um, you know, and it was also kind of coming, coming out of the tail end of the, uh, the recession as well. Um, you know, it was a little bit, maybe a little bit harder to get internships and and such. So, um, I, uh, I, uh, I worked at that job for a couple of years, kind of, um, was very lucky that I, you know, kind of along the way, picked up a great mentor, um, who helped me kind of, um, find my path and, and find, um, what I wanted to do. Um, and so, you know, really she was, um, she really believed in me and said, look, if you want to do this other path, if you want to do investment banking, yeah, it's really hard, but you can do it. Um, you you want to do private equity, you can do it. Um, so I had someone who really believed in me and, um, you know, was able to, uh, make a move to kind of a, a non-traditional investment banking position as a, as a business analyst. Um, so I, you know, it was the front office that I was in front, you know, I was, I went from never really being in front of clients or really only on the phone for kind of administrative duties to being in front of clients, um, every day, um, and emailing with clients every day. Um, and so while I wasn't doing, you know, as much traditional kind of valuation analysis as maybe some of the other analysts, I was able to like, like leverage that position to um, learn a lot about the business and then ultimately um, transition to a regular analyst role um, in, in this boutique bank that I was in. Uh, and then, for, you know, I spent about a year and a half in that role. And then from there, uh, was able to move to uh, private equity. And I've been in my current job for about a year and nine months. So I think that was 
probably a mouthful. So I'll pause no, there. that's cool. No, that's a good start. So yeah, yeah, let's start all the way back at undergrad. So you said you'd kind of you were majoring in history. So you're at a non-target. You're a history major. Um, at what point, you know, did you say was it senior year? Where you're like, oh, what am I going to do for to to make a salary? You know, at what point did you kind of sit up and say, what am I actually going to do? Because I think a lot of kids find themselves in in this situation where they're 20, 21 years old. They've maybe missed the boat. Um, they didn't really come yeah. across. Maybe they didn't find Wall Street Oasis till later in their college career, and they realize, oh my gosh, I want to do investment banking and recruiting to over sure. by sophomore year. Um, so what you know, what did you do, kind of to you know, coming into that senior year, was it, is it okay now you're going to start figuring it out? Yeah, it's a great question. So I, um, I actually did have an internship after my junior year, um, in communications at a big bank, Mm -hmm. um, which is kind of a, you know, it actually kind of made sense for, um, someone with like a, a history and writing background. Um, like I, I was kind of like introduced to this type of role. And so what communications do, like, you know, you know, at a big bank is that they, they kind of write about um, some of the, the bank's achievements. It's like internal communication. So it's not like investor at, relations. It's, it's basically, no, it's at, at a bulge. It was at a bulge bracket and you're kind of like, you know, you're writing about, you know, the top salesperson or this team achieved this. Got it. And, got it. It's like, it's like, press. Sort of it's like PR almost for the bank internally or whatever. How did yeah, you, exactly. how did you come across an internship? Uh, that was your junior summer. Yeah, it was through, um, on campus or networking. I, or? No, no. It was through like a, a family friend kind of last minute. Yeah. Um, you know, I think communications, what I'll say about it is I didn't, I didn't really like it. I think I, I, what I liked was that, um, you were, I worked in this really organized environment and I was, I was paid well. And, um, what were you paid like 30 bucks an hour or 20 bucks an hour? Yeah, it was probably even less. No, it was way less than that. I think like, it was like, but you were saying, like, I think it was probably like 20, 20 something. Yeah. That's I mean, pretty good for like a poor college kid, right? So 2011 or 2012 or something. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so, uh, so, so, um, no, no. And so, you know, you're working in this really kind of organized environment. Um, you're well paid, you know, it's not that stressful or anything like that, but at the end of the day, you're kind of writing about someone else's achievements. And you're like, Oh, this is kind of like, so my job is to just write about what you've done and like to kind of give praise to you. And I'm like, well, I want to actually be the one who's getting the, like, I want to be the one who's actually achieving something and, and ha- having my own success. And and obviously communications, you're going to be, you're kind of more limited in terms of upward mobility and compensation. And I was kind of, I think the important thing was like, I, you know, I was lucky enough to kind of be exposed to this new world where mm-hmm. um, I really had no idea about, about finance, but I was like, wow, there's this whole other side of it. And I'm, if I'm paid like this here, like, I can't even imagine that whole other side where like, they're really <laughs> doing like, they're achieving the things, right? They're, if a billion dollar they're deals winning. and they're, all this they're, stuff. They're bringing feet. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So you kind of it opened it opened your eyes. That sounds like junior summer. Where we're like, wait a second, this whole finance world sounds pretty cool. You're writing about it, so you're kind of getting the right. exposure there. So tell me, right. as you're going into senior year, were you like finance all the way, gung ho, or what was, or, or still kind of trying to find your way? Um, no, I I think I I went back to school and I was like still doing. I was like helping them out at school a little bit. I was still being paid, um, but it was kind of a tricky situation because I knew I really didn't want to do it. Um, so no, like I didn't ultimately end up, um, like, I think if I'd really wanted to pursue that. Did they give that, you like probably, a full-time offer? Like no, to come back? no, no and did. I didn't really want, I didn't really want it either. I was kind of like yeah. trying to like kind of move away from that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I didn't want to get stuck in something, you know, that I didn't want to do. Did you um, realize how far behind you were coming from a tiny no name school with, from the, with a history major? Did you realize that, I mean, were your, was your GPA good or would you have a medium GPA? My GPA grade? was fine. I, Three five or something. Yeah, what was it? Three whole, two. Yeah, it was like three four at three three maybe. So you're you don't even have a separate. So you have like a, a low threes GPA or mid threes GPA. So it's good, uh, but not you're not blowing the socks off. You're a history major and you're at a non target So so you basically have limited options in the finance world. Let's be honest, right? Um, unless you're like an amazing networker somehow and miraculously can break in. 
um, through like the side door and you interview perfectly. That's basically the only way I would see a person with your profile get into a front office banking job right out of school is you're, you're pulling magic on the networking side. But let's say, let's say, so, but at what point were you, did you start kind of doing that groundwork in terms of like to yeah, land that you, first gig? Could you pause it for one second? Sorry, yeah. I had it. Yeah, so it's a great point. I think in terms of, in terms of banking, in terms of knowing the different paths, I think, you know, in my head, like, I remember I, there was a brief time where I kind of was like, you know, my junior year, I was like, um, or senior year, I was like, how do I, how do I do this? You know, can I, can I still, you know, have I completely, um, have I completely missed the boat here? And I was abroad. I, I, I was abroad. Well, I, actually, I was abroad. Um, I met because I was, I was starting to explore it then mm -hmm. uh, my second semester of, of junior year as well. But, um, you know, it, it did feel like I had missed the boat. And so in terms of understanding investment banking and knowing what it was, I think we have a tendency as human beings to, to feel like if we can't do something, if, some, if a path is closed off to us, um, we don't necessarily want to go there in our head and, and learn about it and, and kind of be like, you know, well, look, I can't, look, if I can't do this. So, you know, I'm not going to go in my head. I don't want to cause myself pain and say like, well, you know, I couldn't do this for X, Y, and Z reason. I'm just going to move on. I'm not going to really investigate it. Right. Um, so I think I, maybe I lost a little, maybe I, you know, I lost a little time to being like, oh, you know what? I, I, I can't do this or, or this and that. Um, but, um, you know, and then senior year of college is kind of its own, its own thing to begin with, obviously, but, um, and what party, you know, party sense. <laughs> yeah. You know, you, and, and look, I think when you're also, when you're at a non-target, um, very small over art school, it wasn't surrounded by all these ambitious, <laughs> the most ambitious people I would say, but, um, and by the way, I mean, one note on, on GPA, you mentioned, I think it's so funny to me that GPA is still such a strong metric um that's measured I, I i mean my me personally like i feel like i took some really challenging classes my senior year where i could have um i could have just taken like guitar <laughs> you know yeah um and i took like a three i remember i took like a 300 level psych class um that i had no business being in but it sounded really interesting mm -hmm. and um i kind of struggled in it and I, I think i got like a b minus or something but mm -hmm. like i learned so much in that class so it is funny to me, and I think um, I get it in why GPA is such a metric in, in in recruiting. But I do wish there was something there was something better that you know as, as investment banks that we could do um, to recruit kids. But um, so yeah, I mean back to you know you know me getting out of college. Yeah, I I um geez, so I was like didn't really know. I graduated, didn't have a job, literally. Um, was applying for jobs on a uh, career builder. Before you um, graduated though, were you applying like crazy, like months leading up to the graduation or were you just completely just part and didn't care? Or were you no, thinking, I'm just going to move? Kinda, were, were I didn't you know thinking, how to do it. I, I would say, I think like. Career center um, didn't help you probably. Your parents were like. you career but, center at my yeah. college. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> You're probably. No, I mean, they were just, they were like, yeah, you can go on this website and, you know, click on, talk to this, call this person. And I think when you're, this is actually one of the most um, prescient things that I learned um, that I've learned about networking is networking. You can do it wrong. Um, and I think the biggest thing that I've learned about networking is that if you're going to talk to people, there's, there's two things in my opinion that you should uh, two ways to approach it. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to approach it is to say, I'm going to, I don't know what I want to do. I'm, I'm going to call this person because I want to pick their brain and I want to learn about their day to day. I want to learn about their career path and see if it's a good fit for me. Mm -hmm. The second approach is to say, I know what I want to do. I'm very certain of that. Um, I'm going to call this person and give them a bit of my background and tell them why I'm interested in this and see if they have any ideas for me, if they can connect me to other people, et cetera. Mm -hmm. I think the big mistake people make a lot of the time when they're networking is they try to combine those two things, those two conversations into one conversation. Yeah. That's and, and that, 
And that's, um, well, wouldn't you say the first one where you're exploring more is should be kind of what you're doing early on first. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. And there's nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. I would say you're going to come across better to people mm-hmm. if you split those two things up. So yeah. one the of the hum- biggest the humble, things- just trying to learn oftentimes will open more doors too. And, (laughs) you know, if they they just, if you, if you're admitting you don't know anything and you're just trying to learn, oftentimes they like that attitude and they like the fact that you're a smart kid and you ask, if you ask smart questions, follow-up questions, especially. Exactly. Yeah. So I think, so networking can be intimidating when you don't know how to network. And I think a lot of kids, especially if they're coming from a small liberal arts school, have no idea um, how to network. And so I think- Or they're trying to sound too smart. They feel like they have to sound smart. Right. Yeah. Or they just don't, you know, they don't want to send a hundred emails. Like they don't know. They don't, you, sometimes you got to spam people. Right. But <laughs> so, um, e- so easy on LinkedIn nowadays. I just, I can't believe like, yeah, yeah, you can, exactly. you can make a hundred connection so requests inbound. or even just 30 that are tailored within an hour a day. Like, yeah. It, it's, it's not crazy. that hard. <laughs> um, my um, LinkedIn is, has, cha- has changed the game. It didn't really exist as much yeah. when I was, so, but okay. So you're, you're kind of, you, you've graduated, you have no job. Um, have you no moved job. back with the family at this point? Yeah. I moved back home. Um, what are your parents saying at this point? How much did your degree cost? Like $150,000, $200,000? <laughs> I think my parents were okay. I think they kind of got it. You know, I was again, kind of coming out of the tail end of the recession. It was a little harder. Mm-hmm. Um, I'd say for, for my generation, um, for sure to, uh, you know, to find things, but, but yeah, it was hard for me. I mean, I think I went on, did some traveling, you know, what have you, but I was, you know, I was, I kind of became, yeah, after a couple of months, I became like pretty desperate and I wanted to find something. So I literally got this kind of a rip, my first kind of, um, back middle office job, um, an literally asset, on career asset man- at an asset manager, right? Yeah. So it was really, mm-hmm. it's really wealth management. Yeah really like a fee-based business. So I kind of was able to learn kind of like 10,000 foot business and like how stock brokerage worked, wealth, you know, wealth management worked. And, Mm -hmm. um, you know, it was kind of, it's the kind of thing where you, I think when you're right out of school, um, for someone like me and I'm, and I'm a fairly like introverted person, Mm -hmm. um, there's really in a place like that, there's really kind of two, uh, two options where you're either going to like be cold calling like a hundred times a day, or, uh, you're going to be doing like back office work. Um, so I was doing the back office work. I did that for like a year and change. And I what, were you pay, what were you paid? Like 45 K base? Ex- yeah. Like if maybe a little more than that. Yeah. 50, um, something like that. Yeah. Not a ton. Yeah. Not no, a ton. No bonus. A lot of stuff too. <laughs> huh? And it was stressful too. I would say, you know, stressful, first, yeah. Yeah. my first job, I learned a lot. I moved to, I moved to a bulge bracket, more of like a stable kind of a situation, um, to do similar work. How did you do, um, how did you make that transition from back off to back middle through, office? Just through a recruiter. Yeah. Okay. So you were back middle office at a kind of a smaller wealth management shop, and then you made the transition to a bulge bracket through a recruiter, similar type of back office, middle office role, correct? At this point, were you thinking, hey, I need to get front office investment banking? Or at this point, where was it on your radar? Well, yeah, it was actually, it was right after I started that job that mm-hmm. um, this mentor came in, into my life who, you know, through kind of like a family friend. Yeah. Um, how, was which, how much older was she? Uh, she? Maybe like 20 years older. Okay, so it's perfect. Um, so she, yeah, she's just been through the gauntlet. Super, okay. just a really, yeah, amazing kind of person who's, mm-hmm. um, you know, and I remember... Cause in my head, I kind of was like, well, yeah, I'm doing a lot. You know, I was doing a lot better than I was. I was, you know, I wasn't like thrilled with everything, but I kind of had some kind of a, um, uh, what's, what's the word I'm looking for? Cushy life. I had, I had, <laughs> no, I mean, I wouldn't say cushy life, but I had like a sort of a plan about what I wanted to do for the rest of my career, how I was going to do it. Uh, Can you share gonna, where you were in this bulge bracket? Like what city were you in? I was um, in New York. You're in New York. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, at that point, um, did you get a raise going from like 50 to 60 K when you made that jump to the bulge? Yeah, bracket? it was like yeah. 60 something, whatever. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, and I think I got, I would get, I think I would get overtime too. I don't remember. Okay. Um, so like but, what types of things day to day, what do you give somebody an idea of middle back office? You're clearing, oh, literally, clearing yeah, trades. So what are you doing? You would like clear trades, but I would also, um, 
I would do like wire verification. So I would call clients in like all across the country and we would do, oh, like, okay, let's confirm that you want to wire a million dollars to this account. Or I spoke, I speak Spanish too. So I would um, be calling clients in Latin America as well. Um, cool. And, and uh, you know, it was like really kind of fairly mindless work, <laughs> you know, without a, without a, a career trajectory that, you know, I thought would be interesting. To what me. is the career trajectory there? You just kind of move up and they gradually give you a few pay raises every year. So, and some and people you... in that position had like moved over to the front office as like a, to work directly for a broker. And um, this was a good, it was a good, the bulge racket I was at was a good wealth management shop. Like they had some really good yeah. brokers there. And like, as a, as a, it's called a sales assistant, like in the traditional, mm -hmm. um, you know, they, I think, you know, you have like a client, I think it was called a client service associate. Yeah. Um, place. Um, they kind of give it a more, a little bit more of a fancy title so that people maybe feel, feel a little bit better about for sure. themselves. For sure. <laughs> but, uh, you know, th that you're, you know, you're dealing with clients directly, but you're, um, you know, you probably, you do really well, but you're really, it's not the most intellectual, um, gig other than, other than really just being good with clients, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, and really not, I think wealth in general is kind of tougher for younger folks because it's like, well, okay, you're going to, you're 24 years old. You're calling some 60 year old on a phone and telling them that you want to manage their money for them. Like they're going to be like, fuck off. Like, yeah. Totally. Can I curse or yeah, you know. can curse. That's fine. <laughs> uh, they're going to be so, like, you're not qualified to do this. Like I'm yeah. not, I'm just going to go to this other guy who's got gray hair and you know, you, you're not going to, I'm not giving you my money. So. Yeah, or at least a gray beard like me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so wait a second. So, but you're at this bulge bracket for not, you're for less than a year and you make a transition to a front office role. So this mentor seemed to have a big impact on you. So tell me how she did that. What, what were the main things she told you? How did you prep to actually how do you even get the interviews for a front office? It's super, super hard. Super hard, yeah. To get even interviews coming from, you know, you're already pigeonholed at this point. You're a history major, mediocre GPA. You're in a middle back office. How are you even getting a look for an interview? Is this like the only interview you got? Or, or did you get a bunch because you were doing some, a something? Yeah, how did, yeah. You, how did you land those? Because I think people struggle even to get those interviews. So I want to know, like from, from yeah, so a I'll similar I'll situation. You, I'll tell you what happened. I mean, so... The first, I remember first talking to her and I was kind of like, oh, whatever. I'm just going to talk to this person. I'd never met her before. Yeah. Um, I'm just going to kind of talk to this person and like, you know, she offered, she had offered to kind of help me. And I was like, sure. Like, I don't, you know, I had kind of built this world for myself where I saw limitations, right? I could, you know, this is the kind of, I would, you know, do this for a couple of years maybe. And then I would try to go to business school or, or something. I, yeah. I didn't know exactly yeah. what I wanted to do. Yeah. Um, but I had this plan in my head and, you know, she proceeds to get on the phone with me and, and is like, that makes, that doesn't make sense. Like, what are you, like, what are you, you know, like that long term, what are you doing? That's not a good plan. And she was brutally honest with me. And I was kind of like, I was kind of like shaking a little bit. Um, but she's like, what do you want to do? You know, are you, are you interested in investment banking and this and that? And I was like, yeah, I am. But like, I always thought, you know, that's not, that's not necessarily available to me. Um, and and she's she like, say, you what can she do say? it, you can yeah. do it. Like there's ways, like it's hard, but like, you know, it's possible. Um, so I was like, I really believe, you know, I really, she kind of like grabbed hold of me a little bit as a person was like, you know, you can do this. And so I really believed it. And I, <laughs> this is going to sound crazy. I literally set about to, um, to trying to, to trying to, um, without an accounting background, it's extra hard, obviously. But um, I was like, I'm going to go and really try to do this for six months. Um, I'm going to give it, you know, I'll give it six months. Let me try to find a way into investment banking, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. I really, really hit it hard. Um, and I was, uh, so I literally like go after work. I would like literally go to Starbucks at night and I would like sit there and I was literally had a, like an accounting textbook and I was like reading it. Sounds ridiculous, but um, I probably didn't learn that much, too much accounting that way. But um, and I was looking, and I was looking for jobs too. And and there actually are, there are investment banking analysts postings on some of these job websites. Mm -hmm. um, and so, um, oh, the other thing I did was I took a course with uh, Investment Bank Institute. Yep. 
which which was fairly helpful. Um, I wouldn't say incredibly helpful, but should have taken ours. No, just kidding. <laughs> yeah, no, if, I, if I'd known. <laughs> no, it's cool. So you're. I don't know if you guys offer in person at that time, but no, yeah. no, we don't. Uh, not yet. Next year. Um, but so so I think um, what's yeah, interesting. Well, What's interesting yeah, no, is you started kind of investing yourself. You kind of, she, she kind of shook you up a little bit and you're like, okay, I'm actually going to give this a shot. So you're, give it a shot. you're I mean, working for what, 40, 45 hours a week. Yeah, uh, 45, the day, 50. Right. But it was a day the job. Most, wasn't the most demanding job. Yeah. So um, you could, you had time kind of during the day to do a little bit of here and there, but then you also had time at night. Um, so what you'd spend a couple hours at Starbucks every night, something like that, either studying or applying to jobs. And then tell me like, when was your first kind of IB front office interview? And what was that like? Was that the first, that's the first one you landed or like, did you bomb your, a few, what happened? Yeah. I'm trying to remember if I had another like first round mm -hmm. somehow, but, um, I, um, yeah. So I actually saw that literally was on, I was on, um, indeed. Mm -hmm. And I, and I was, I literally searched, I was at Dunkin' Donuts on the Upper East Side at like 11 o'clock at night on like a Monday or Tuesday night. Mm -hmm. Like, did you not? The Dunkin' Donuts on 93rd and, and 3rd <laughs> Ave for anyone who, you know, who lives in the city. Um, and uh, literally searched investment banking analyst on Indeed. And there was like, there was a boutique bank who had like a few postings for like investment banking analysts. Mm -hmm. um, so I, um, I was like, okay, that's interesting. So I literally, so then I, I went back and asked my mentor about it. And she was like, okay, I have, I know someone there. Let me try to get your resume in. Mm -hmm. And it turns out that this bank was, you know, was one that would, um, would hire, you know, maybe a little bit, they would hire a little bit more people without the traditional background um, than some, some other places might. And so I didn't get, I actually didn't interview for a typical investment banking analyst role. I interviewed for a business analyst role, which um, was working sort of for uh, one managing director um, very directly. And he was kind of, he was looking for someone who um, didn't need the, a background in valuation and accounting, but he wanted a hard worker and um, someone who was going to grind really hard and wanted to learn. And I was like, that's me. I can do that. Like, let me, like, let me in, you know? Yeah. Like I want to learn, like I want it so bad. Um, so, you know, the thing, the other thing with, with her was that she was like, she really helped me get ready for, for these interviews. So it was a business analyst. It wasn't like an investment banking analyst. So business analyst mean like you were just basically like almost an assistant to an MD directly or something. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. There's some, I, I don't want to so get. It, was it a lot of admin type stuff? A lot of admin, a lot of, email, but it would be emailing with clients a lot, you know, sending stuff to clients. Yeah. Um, you know, so, some I, so did you feel like, well, at least did your mentor feel like, Hey, this was a good kind of way to get in. To, oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah. She this was, was like, great, just take no, it. it was a yeah. Great bank. And you're sitting with, with the rest of the group. So you're actually sitting with all the analysts. Right. So you're kind of absorbed. Did you, so when you got there, how long were you in that business analyst role before you were able to make the transition to a full on IB analyst role? Yeah. So that's, it's a great question. Cause it was like, um, it was almost two years that I did that which I think was kind of the acknowledged um, thing. Like I didn't want to Drop do one year and try to jump immediately. That would be a little bit yeah. uh, obnoxious. You know? what, were your, what were your hours like going as into this business analyst role? I assume it, they skyrocketed. Skyrocketed. Yeah. You yeah. 80, 80 hours plus a week about. Yeah, it was. Um, and it was traveling to conferences and um, going to meetings a lot more, but yeah, all of a sudden you go, from leaving work at were you doing um, pitch so, book data work at all were you, or you they wouldn't let you touch the models i assume initially or they did i could open up the model and try to learn it myself <laughs> but, but, but they, yeah times. but did they were you doing any pitch pitch book work or was it mostly like you just helping any way you could um as a lot assistant? of yeah i would do pitch book work but it would yeah. be very specific to sort of the niche that i was um that i was in and i, I would work for a product banker yeah um so uh, it's kind of a it's kind of a unique role. Do you mind that, sharing your pay? Like, was it significantly less than the IB analyst? I assume the bonus was much less, but maybe that base was similar. Yeah, I was in the six figures. Um, it mm -hmm. wasn't the bonus was was less, but it wasn't. I think it was probably a little more than half of what a regular. Analyst so you're 
so all in si- all in six figures. So like what, like eighty something, one twenty maybe, I, something like that. My all first in year, one twenty. Okay, that's yeah. pretty good. That's a huge jump. Huge jump. Yeah, I went from making. I mean, you're working about thirty extra hours a week, but you're also getting paid for it. But and you're learning. I think that's yeah, yeah. That was a big thing. It was like you know, I was learning. Um, I was learning things I didn't know. I was learning about the business, and but I still wasn't learning. The valuation, um, the, the modeling. Yeah, exactly. You weren't on the deal. So you wait two years working this, these long I hours. Get, I got to work on a couple deals here and there, but it was like, yeah. it wasn't really, I wasn't getting evaluated the same way. And so that's ultimately like when you're really just working for one person, um, as opposed to being in the analyst pool where, you know, you're subject to the round table and you're going to get ranked against your peers every yeah. year. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a very different mm-hmm situation in terms of the pressure in terms of the learning looking um, at those kids as they're going through there not sleeping working really hard did you feel like what how did you feel you stacked up in terms of do you feel like i can compete or you saw the stuff they were doing and you're like oh man i still have a long way to go i felt like i could compete i did yeah, yeah absolutely because um, you're putting in the hours right i was a little older than these kids at this point i was like i can do this work like this isn't yeah um i'm gonna need to learn it but i'll like i'll put in the hour and so um you know, that was a tricky conversation to try to move over. That's what I want to, that's what I want to dive into. Cause that's what a lot of kids find themselves in that tricky conversation. So how did you approach the guy you've been working for, for over at this point, what was it a year and a half before you had this com- tough conversation? Yeah, it was almost, almost two years. And he was like, you know, he wanted me to stay another year with him and then, um, and then, you know, probably, you know, get promoted. Um, I was like, geez, I'm going to get promoted. And like, He's like, then you could, you know, then you could go and be an associate and, um, you know, do execution kind of a thing. And I'm like, well, but I, but then I, I wouldn't have learned. Yeah. I hadn't, I wouldn't have been working on the deals. And so by the end of that second year, I wasn't learning as much. And so that was really, yeah. for me, that was kind of big in terms of like me reevaluating. Um, it was time for, it was time for a change. Yeah. Yeah. It was time for a change. And I, and like I said, I felt like, I could do the work. Like I just. So then what did you say? How did you convince him to let you be an analyst? Yeah, he was a good guy. I mean, I think I had to have a couple conversations. I talked to, you know, important people in my life about it and like how to have this conversation. I think it's hard when you need to have, (laughs) this sounds, sounds simple, but I mean, what I would rec, what I would say to kids, especially when kids who are interviewing and stuff like that, we need to have these important interviews, these important conversations with people. It's always good to talk it over with someone else that you trust first and say, here's what I'm going to say. How does this sound? Because you're in a kind of like an emotionally heightened state and you're like, well, you you know, you're almost kind of conflicted in terms of how your ideas are going to come across about something. Mm -hmm. Um, So, you know, I I remember like here, here's what I'm going to say to this person. And Mm -hmm. um, I think I was talking to my, maybe my my mom or my brother or something. They were like, well, maybe say this instead, you know, say, put it this way, or, you know, you're um, that way you're kind of, you know, you don't want to burn any bridges, right? That's right. Really- so you're kind of trying to walk the tightrope of still being appreciative, but you know, also saying you know you want more, and you feel like this and like an analyst role would provide that additional learning experience to actually be getting the transaction experience. Yeah, exactly. So, and so what did he say? Like, so you had the first call. He was he's like, I'll do another year, and the, the first conversation. How did you even say, hey, do you mind chatting for a, a couple minutes? You kind of no, he was the kind of person I could walk into his office at yeah. all times and. You know, okay. we had that kind of relationship. And so you had, so it was easy to talk to him, but that first. I, had to t- I talked to him and then I talked to the the group kind of HR manager. We had mm-hmm. like an internal HR manager in the group. And, um, you know, I said, this is what I want, but ultimately, so I did, I did that. And they, I, th- you know, I ended up getting dinged in terms of my experience level. Cause they were kind of like, well, you don't have the deal experience. So we're not, you can't just transition over um like that and it you know i was okay with that because i knew i would be learning again um and i was able to what do you mean you got dinged like for an associate role or something no they they dinged me so like i had really done basically two years at that point yeah but instead of being an analyst three i was like they're well you're gonna go back to an analyst too well of right? course because yeah, that's fine you lose a year it's not yeah bad. yeah so okay so you were like that's fine <laughs> Right. I was like, that's fine. I was, that's yeah. fine. It was still kind of hard to, to take though a little bit where you're like, oh, this is, you yeah. know, you have an ego. You're like, well, what about okay. this? What about that? But, but, um, so 
Yeah, and then I would say I don't. I wouldn't I call got, that a ding. They were just like, hey, you can't go analyst three. You just got to come analyst two. But did they offer yeah, that to was, you right well, up? It was the, at right the end the of bat. analyst analyst one, so they were almost like dinging me a year and a half too. Yeah. So, so but were they? Of, did they offer that to you right off the bat? No, like, they didn't. They were like, I was like, I'm going to move, and they're like, that's fine. And it was kind of like you. I stayed in my position, and then a few months later, they were like, you're not ready to, you're not ready to be an analyst three, right? What we do you them, mean? What do you mean? You said I'm going to move. Right. So when I, when I had the conversation with my boss, my boss and then the yeah. HR manager, yeah. um, they were like, are you sure you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, absolutely. I'm very sure. They're like, okay, we support you. Um, we'll start, you know, we'll ease you into things, but they didn't exactly tell me right then and there, like where, how my evaluation was going to work and everything like that. So ultimately when they moved me back, it was, it was kind of, a, it was hard for me to to take to a certain extent, but ultimately I got over it quickly and I, you know, I kind of moved on. And so the initial thing where they said, okay, yeah, we'll support you. But then when did they tell you they were going to make you an analyst, basically analyst two started and they're in analyst one. Yeah. Right. So it was like, like a month later, two months it later, it was like probably three, four months later. Oh my gosh. Okay. So, but had you been doing any sort of kind of front office work in between those three, four months? I had, but it wasn't like a ton, probably the best. Yeah. And it wasn't like, the and this is actually really, I, w- I would say like one of the most important things about investment banking um, that's so interesting to me is like, there's a lot of internal politics. Mm-hmm. Um, so like building relationships internally in a group mm-hmm. um, with different managing directors, different VPs, different associates as an yeah. analyst yeah, is like so important. Like it's literally like the, the most, most important, important thing thing that you can do. Um, and so ultimately that's why I was able to have success when I, when I transitioned over, despite having that original kind of setback where they were like, well, we got to move you back. Cause you're not ready. Um, I was like, you know what, like I can prove myself. I can learn. Let me, you know, I'll start kind of back closer to the bottom and I'll, you know, try to kick ass for, um, for, you know, as long as I need to do that. So tell me about um, like, so you're there then for another, I mean, you're total almost there for four years. So you're, you're now in the front office for true front office IB analyst position for almost two years, right? Yeah, I think it was like, it ended up being like a year and a half. Maybe. I want to get to private equity recruiting before we had to call this. So, yeah, tell, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so tell me a little bit about so, so, like when that just, came on the radar. And, yeah, let me just yeah. say quickly, like I would yeah. say, you know, I was able, I was really lucky. Um, there's a lot of, in, in, within banking, there's, within a group in banking, sometimes there could be managing directors who are, um, or senior vice presidents who are doing coverage, who do very little revenue. And you, you might not learn, or maybe um, in the group I was in, it was an industry group. So there was different products. There was equity, there was M&A, there was debt. And so I knew that M&A is where you learned the most, right? Um, so I was like, at first I wasn't getting put on the best stuff. I was getting put on a like, maybe some equity stuff. And I was like, I'm not learning. I'm not learning. Like, this isn't what I came here. Like I wanted to, I want to learn. I want to learn. Um, so I talked to one of the MDs that I wanted to work for about it. And he's like, okay, like I got it. But like at first, like nothing, you know, it took over a month. And then finally, randomly, they needed someone on one of their deals um, for like the weekend because they were like underwater. Mm-hmm. And I was like, let's sign, sign me up. Like, this is what exactly what I want. Yeah. And it was an M&A deal. I, it was an M&A deal. And I, yeah. and I just was like, all I can do is do a great job this weekend. Mm-hmm. And I like stayed up all night or whatever. Like, you know, the whole, I, I was there every day, Saturday, Sunday, like mm-hmm. kicked ass on it. And they were like, Oh, like, I was like, okay. They were like, okay, you're going to just stay on this deal. Like, and I was like, that's amazing. And so that was my, my mindset. And like, I, um, you know, like, so yeah, I'd had a setback, but I was like, let me go and work on the most difficult thing that I can find because that's where I'm going to learn the most. And despite having, like, I might have really bad hours working on this deal, but like, I'm going to learn. And like, you don't always learn, you know, in banking, like some things you're going to learn, some things you won't, it'll be administrative. Yeah. Um, Sometimes it's hard to get those opportunities to get that deal experience on your resume. And that's critical. Yeah. And then, so I like, I just stayed really focused for that team and I was able to um, 
work on three consecutive M and A deals for them, and they're it's really awesome. successful. And they they were like, you know, they they wanted me to um, to stay, and you know, had me, you know, got me promoted and everything there. Um, so it was right before, the, you know, I knew ultimately, like I. So you got the analyst associate promote there. Yeah, I was offered it. Um, yeah, I, I left three months before it. It, tri- um, it yeah, took- it triggered. Yeah, but so tell me, when did PE even come into the radar? Was your mentor kind of came back in the picture here? I was like, what do you? She want was, to- yeah, and she was yeah. like, oh, it's a regular <laughs> analyst role. Like that's mm-hmm. like you should think about PE. And I was like, <laughs> I just <laughs> moved. What was her backer real quick? Did she go IBP? <laughs> She went straight to PE. <laughs> she was like, <laughs> so she was always guiding you to get to get there. She was okay, a beast. Yeah, yeah, she's she's an old beast. To throw. I mean, she's just one of the smartest, hardworking people that. Well, I, I want know. to bring her on the pod next. Yeah, uh, yeah, you might. <laughs> but yeah, all right, so so go. Uh, okay, so go on. So so you this was kind of on your radar. When did you start talking to recruiters? Did you have to do most of the kind of networking to land that? You know, you're at a you're at a boutique, a good name, but it's not obviously like the recruiters aren't pounding down the door to recruit you. Especially again, the recruiters, especially for the, some of the larger upper upper middle market and mega funds, are still looking at your school. They're still looking at your major. They're still looking at your GPA, even three four years out of school. Net for you, what is it? Five years out of school at this point? Yeah, it was five. Yeah, it was five so years. How did school. you start? It was really land- hard. Yeah. It's so really how hard, did you? Man. How did you start recruiters landing interviews? Are- Private equity recruiters are some of the, it's really, it's really tough. Um, well, there's, there's a formula and they know what the mega funds and the, the middle markets want to see. And they're, all they're doing is taking a risk if they put a non-traditional candidate there. Um, exactly. So why even take that risk? Because they're, exactly. filling, they're filling the seats. So tell me how you actually got interviews or an interview that you, you turned into a PE offer. Yeah, so it's, it's a great question. So I would say that, in working on these three M&A deals in a row, um, I started to really build some momentum internally mm-hmm. and, and build confidence in my skill set, um, which really helped me. And so um, I had spoken to recruiters for like, you know, the two years preceding. I was kind of like, oh, I would get inbounds and they would, I would say, oh, I'm interested. And I wasn't getting a ton of interviews. Um, but then all of a sudden, right before I was getting promoted, um, you know, I was getting more. I was getting, having more of these conversations and I was able to say, look, like I have this promotion offer. I'm still interested in this, but you know, no pressure. I think maybe that gave me a little bit of, it was good to have that, not a backup plan, but it was good to have another um, alternative there to take a little pressure off in terms of like, timing you know, and whatever. this is a good option too yeah. um, for me. And so um, I, I would say though that I got, two interviews I, I that year i had a few i had a few interviews um middle market pe funds middle market yeah, yeah middle market pe firms um a lot of them i i sourced through networking though and one in particular where i got very close to getting it mm-hmm. that would have been staying in new york was literally me um writing someone on linkedin and saying that i wanted to grab a coffee with them mm-hmm. and then go in and going to have a coffee and, and, and I think the big key here is again, like you go in confidence to these meetings and you're not really asking for something. You're just saying like, Hey, like, you know, I just want to give you my background. I'm not going to be like, please give me a job, please. You know, um, that got you into the process though. It got you into the process. Yeah. All of a sudden this person who, um, who had worked in my bank before. And so I knew kind of knew that way a little bit. Yeah. Um, but didn't really know him very well at all. Was like a day later, he's like, "Oh yeah, like, um, send me your resume." I'm like, "Okay." Two days after that, I get reached out to by another person at his fund, and and he's like, "Yeah, like, why don't you come in for an interview?" Um, so just like literally like that. Yeah. Like I, I hadn't asked for anything. I was just like, um, you know, I think Did I presented you, well at this. How point. many How many people were you were you paying on LinkedIn like that per week? Would you say? Not that many, honestly. Mm-hmm. I was probably Ten, one or five two a week. Just one or let two. Let me just get coffee. Yeah. yeah let me get and, coffee. And get were coffee. they converting to like one coffee chat a week or something? Yeah, probably. One out of every, especially if, if it's someone who has worked in your group before, I think for right. the most part, they'll, okay. they'll grab a coffee with you for 15, 20 minutes or you, however long. Is this, the, is this the firm you ended up, this first one? No, this one you said you almost got the no, offer. No, I didn't, I didn't so get it. You get to what, um, final rounds. Got to a and, second round. No, it was a second round. Yeah. Um, 
but you know, it's private equity. It doesn't take much to knock you out of a private equity recruiting yeah. process. I'll say that having okay. kind of been through a few, <laughs> um, it's, it's really competitive. Um, it is. And so then so, how did you end up getting the, the role that you ended up accepting? The, the one that I, yeah. Yeah. So the one that I got actually, um, like I said, my, the boss, when I first got to this boutique was a product banker and like I was interviewed, I would, I would email with clients a lot. Mm-hmm. And so um, this was a client who, when I first started there, like it had been three and a half, four years earlier, was very close with my boss. And, um, you know, I had, I had emailed with him a ton of times, like send him, send him this, send him that. Always try to, you know, be very professional, speak to them on the phone, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, uh, you know, randomly had talked to my boss, my old boss about this interview I had just had, um, and said, and you were no, fine with it. You were, you were out in the open that you were recruiting for PE. Yeah. Some it's, it's actually really interesting because some MDs in banking are very, um, okay with it. It's really bizarre. Yeah. And some are um, overprotective and curse you yeah, out or get mad they, about it. Yeah. And they see, well, they see folks as future clients too, if they, you know, get, go to the right. So that's how he saw it. Yeah. That's how he saw it. And he was like, yeah, he was like, Oh yeah. Like that they're, they're looking for someone now. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, their, their other associates just left. And so, um, things moved really, really quickly there. And, um, I was able to, uh, to land that role and been in that role for about a year and nine months. Was it tough or was with the relationship, it was basically pretty easy. Like the job was tailor made for you. Did you feel like you were in a very competitive process or because the relationship was so strong with your MD? I think it was hard. Like I had to do, I had to do a model and I had to do a presentation. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think once I got past that, I felt like, and then I went there in person, it was, it was not in New York. So this was going to be a relocation. Yeah. I would say this, the folks who are recruiting for PE, especially if you're coming from a non-target, like just be open to relocation. (laughs) Um, yeah. And you know, it can be temporary. Like if you do a great job, like you'll, you know, have a lot more options coming out of that. Um, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's fair. um, So do you feel like, um, so you had the modeling test, all that stuff, you passed all that stuff, and then it was kind of kept your options open. But did you, did you feel like, um, well, let's talk about pay a little bit. So you, you, we never talked about kind of how much it jumped from yeah. when you were kind of almost like the assistant to the MD to the then front office. Did the bonuses obviously jump significantly? So you went like 120 first year to like what, 140, then up, then it probably jumped closer to 200, something like that. I think it was, but because I got dinged, I didn't. Oh, you kind of went back. You were like flat. Yeah, I was like, I barely went up. Yeah, I barely went up. And then my last year, because I was getting promoted, like I had a feeling I was going to get, you know, really good comp. Mm -hmm. Um, But the policy in my bank was that if you're a lateral hire, which I was, wasn't in the two-year program um, and you left before, and I got my job offer in March. Yeah. Bonuses are in August. So if you left before August, like, that's it. That <laughs> so I never really got that. Uh, the last bonus. It was well worth it in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the things that you're working at, just obviously better hours. You're learning more. Um, what are your hours now? Like you're doing probably 80 plus previously, right? If not more. Yeah. The hours are a lot better. Although uh, I was traveling a lot, obviously COVID mm-hmm. traveling a lot less. Um, hours are probably in the, 60 ish a week region. Yeah. And what's your, do you mind offering your pay for a middle market job? Or, or? Going on. Yeah. So I'm in a, I'll say this, I'm in a low tax state. Um, so the pay, uh, the pay is a little lower. I'm, I'm below 200, but I'm uh, above 160. So I'll, I'll give you that cool. band no, that's helpful. kind of in there. And so, um, so yeah. But it's definitely very different in terms of, um, you know, I would say there's more pressure in private equity in terms of the actual work you're doing. Mm -hmm. Um, There's less people to kind of ask questions or check your work and um, more lonely, definitely more of a lonely existence, more politics. (laughs) Yeah. Um, But it's been really good. And so, yeah, I I feel very lucky to have kind of, um, you know, had the people in my life that have kind of, helped me along the way. Um, you know, and, and I think, um, 
What's next for you? Business school? Yeah, I think business school is probably probably going to yeah. be next. Um, I think I wrote down some notes. I don't know if you want me to just yeah. quickly read off, Please. off things. Um, so I said, control what you can control, right? Mm. It, so it's really easy to get swept up, I think, for people in what they can't control in a, in a recruiting process, an interview process, um, in a career in general, right? Mm -hmm. There's always so many variables, like investment banking and private equity, like someone's going to have a conversation, you know, like, and maybe you rub someone the wrong way at some point, or you do something wrong. And, you know, you have to kind of like, um, look at set, like if you have a setback, right. Whether it's in an interview, whether it's, in your job and you will in investment banking and private equity, I guarantee you, mm -hmm. you will have setbacks. You will have things that you mess up. Like to just look at it as a learning opportunity um, and just try to make yourself better and, and, and not take things personally and um, you know, things like that. And um, I, I, the other thing, I, one of the other things I wrote down was I wrote walk towards the fire. Right. And it's something where I think a lot of people in investment banking I had like, because I had worked so hard to get to, to get there, I'd been like, I had this a bit of a complex, like, I, like I'm going to work my fucking ass off. No one's going to mm -hmm. work harder than me. And, uh, and so I made it my mission to work on like the hardest things a lot of the time where I knew I could learn the most. And I think a lot of kids, maybe if they land this job early in their junior year and they've studied finance, like maybe they're kind of like, burnt out by the first end of their first analyst year. And they're kind of like, ah, I don't know. Um, so, you know, what I would say to people is like that internal competitiveness um, in, in, a, in a bank, like does ultimately matter. Cause you, like, you're going to get more experience. You're going to be um, more confident in, in the interviews that you go to, unless you do on cycle recruiting, in which case, like, you know, you have your job, like right when you get there, but um um, you know, focusing on learning, focusing on being competitive, like really like, yeah, you're getting ranked against your peers. Like you want to, you want to not be, you want to at least be middle bucket. Like you do not want to be, um, in the bottom bucket. Um, yeah, that's fair. And, and the last thing, yeah, the, the only other thing was, um, I wrote embrace the suck, embrace the suck. And that means like, you know, if you're doing a job search, you're doing a networking search if you're a sophomore in college or a junior in college um it's not fun it's not fun right you're like emailing 100 investment banking analysts a week or uh, investment banking associates and um trying to get them on the phone for 10 minutes and it's not fun doing that right it's work um but if you embrace it and you say like well this will suck now but it's going to really help me in my life down the line um, it can go a long way. So that was kind of the, I love it. Yeah. And I think it's, it's great wisdom. I just think, you know, it's hard at 20, I think at 21, 22 years old, a lot of these, a lot of kids feel like they know a lot of kids feel like they're doing a lot of work, but they've never really worked a hundred hour week. They've never really worked a hundred hour week to think, Oh, I got all these classes. I got sports. I got all this homework. It's, you know, I'm used yeah. to this schedule, but no. When you work a hundred hour a week, it's very different to hear about it. It's very different to live it. And so when you get into that world, you realize that like an extra 10, 20 hours of networking per week is act during college is actually pretty easy. Right. <laughs> In comparison. Exactly. So like if you, if you relatively speaking, when people think I want investment banking, I usually challenge them. I said, are you sure you want it? Because it's brutal. Like, are you sure you really want this or you just want the pay? That's a great point. Uh, and if you yep. can't, if you can't even bo be bothered to stay up late, network while you're at school, how are you going to not be miserable in life? Like if you can't find it, if you don't find it interesting enough to talk to people about their careers, then you're probably about this because you're really actually passionate and interested in it. It's going to be tough. It's going to be really tough. Yeah. Fewer words have not been spoken. <laughs> I think it gets, yeah. People see like the glamour side of it and yeah, it's, it's hard, man. Like you're, you're at work at one in the morning trying to figure out really complex shit sometimes, or you yeah. got to send an important analysis to a client or to a buyer yeah. at one or two in the morning. And that's what I mean about walk towards the fire. Like 
you don't hear about that in the interview, right? Like you don't hear about the, like, it's just you at 2 AM. Like it's important, you know, and like, you got to figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, but I enjoyed that challenge. Like I embraced that. So yeah, yeah, if you right, exactly. Like you said, if you can't find the time to network, um, you know, it's going to be a struggle for you. For sure. I'd say. Great, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate all the wisdom and that you shared with the listeners. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for everything. Absolutely. My pleasure, Patrick. Thank you uh, so much for having me. And thanks to you, my listeners at Wall Street Oasis. If you have any suggestions whatsoever, please don't hesitate to send them my way, Patrick at wallstreetoasis.com. And until next time.